Because you're a uh, radio presenter. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Here's Newsbeat. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's Do you think your that? voice changes when you start going to it? Uh, I don't know. Well, you tell me. Does it? No, mm, I don't, am I talking so, differently sounds now? Exactly sounds exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's odd. I think you do hear people that have got radio voices. We, and people always say, oh, your voice sounds like you should be on the radio. But I think it's because they've heard me on the radio. Do you think but, that's what it is? Yeah. But your you, voice you is so recognisable. Uh, this is weird, is right? Is it because you're on the radio? No, because yours is as well, right? <laughs> no, okay, we'll do Alex, that. Alex, yours isn't. Um, <laughs> Damn it. So not I yet. Could, I could train myself. No, but I think... I mean? but train I, yourself yeah. to be recognisable. What I mean is you have a voice that that could blend into a crowd, couldn't it, that voice? Um, That's not an insult. I'm being attacked for my It's not voice. an attack. This it's is... not an attack. <laughs> because I think, I, I, what I would say is it's a very nice, neutral voice. But Jay, Jamie, I could recognise from one word. His is quite harsh. Mm. It annoys me. Great, grating, yeah. yeah. Well, the funniest thing is, well, Matt, you can explain this. You had a new game that you played on yeah. Radio 1. So I pitched this game, which I was convinced was going to be great, called uh, uh, Surprise Celebrity. And the idea is that we would get three callers on and two of them would be, you know, normal people, Radio 1 listeners, and mm. one of them would be a celebrity pretending to be a normal person. So they'd have to come up with a backstory. They'd have to maybe think about a different voice to put on, something that would, if we were to interrogate them, they'd yeah, be able yeah. to live a different life for those few minutes. <laughs> and we, Jamie came on as someone called Tom, and the very first word he said was, hello. And I was like, oh, it's Jamie. And I, Exit. Off hello. <laughs> hello. And then you, you, you had a plan, didn't you? You'd written down some things that you were going to be from Bristol and then realised very quickly as he was doing it, he couldn't do a Bristolian accent. So then he said, he was like in panic, said, well, what do you do? And he said, oh, I, I work for a, for a sweet company. <laughs> what a stretch. I Incredible. Said, I said, I'm a supply chain manager. For a sweet company, company, yeah. And you also, you caveated that with, with weirdly, I'm a supply chain manager for a sweet company, which if you were a supply chain manager for a sweet company, you wouldn't think was weird. Yeah. So you would never say that. <laughs> and, um, then, and then I went to, where are you from? And I went... Kenzel. Kenzel Rice. But, but well, Kenzel in Bristol. Yeah. Kenzel Kenzel but born in Brixton, he then doubled down on. Yeah. I, I couldn't, my geography, I couldn't get further than no. Bristol. I didn't know what was below it. Is this, you were like, this is a man who's never left London. I mean, yeah. Yeah. No, he went Brixton. I was like, what the hell's below Brixton? I don't know. <laughs> There's nothing below Brixton. He's never been that far south before. Um, oh, so yeah, God. so um, you almost ruined that game for us. But it made it better because we just it did, laughed It did it. make it better. Was, was anyone duped? No, I mean... <laughs> Immediately then, yeah. Every, everyone on the text knew who you were, but also uh, Molly and I gave each other a look of like, where's Jamie? Like, we, we've, got, <laughs> yeah. we've still got another caller to talk to after this to work out whether... Or, or like, we, we all know that it's yeah, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, a, it was a joy. And, <laughs> and you, Jamie, you laughing is just one of my favourite things. Oh, we were saying this because I, I reposted it the other day about uh, Murder and Success. It's my favourite thing. I watch, it, <sighs> I watch it maybe once every six months and I love introducing... That clip, I mean, I love that show generally. It's amazing. But, mm. but you on that show, when you have the earpiece in, <laughs> I could just watch it endlessly. It's so good. Have you seen this? Yeah, it's very oh, good. Man, oh, man, it's, it's the best. And, and the greatest thing about that show, for the listeners who don't know, it was just, it's basically uh, you, you are a celebrity or whatever we want to call them, come in and they have to pretend to be a police officer and they have to solve a crime. Mm. And you're given no script no lines, nothing at all, and you just have to go with it. Tom Davis was the um, was the detective, and it was the funniest thing I have ever. Well, well you I can, still have people say, you can tell that. it's um because I and I often think, well, how would I have done on a show like that? Because you're meant to be taking in clues, aren't you? Yeah. But actually, you're just being thrown in, and it's it's, it's a show that I think about a lot because part of part of my job is coming out with telly shows and trying to pitch yeah. them. And I think, how on earth did they pitch that show? Mm. Because the idea is so unique and so far out. Because to, to, for, to, to say, okay, we'll get some celebrities and solve a crime. Okay, well, maybe the idea stops there. But no, they say, actually, we're going to do it in a world where there are character actors and impressionists playing either really brilliantly or really badly other celebrities. Mm. It's this sort of, it's like an impression show with yeah. a it's, celebrity entertainment show with a detective show. It's such it's an odd one to, I mean, how do they pitch it? I don't know. But also, do you get 
uh, Matt, because you have this fantastic brain. Thank you. You do, yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm, so, I'm glad like, someone said it. Yeah. Yeah. You have I've, not, I've not actually seen it yet. <laughs> yeah. At some point, Alex, it will be revealed. Yeah. 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 At some point. <laughs> once, I, once in two thirds of this cup of tea, <laughs> it might decide to make a showing. <laughs> <laughs> but you do, do you get, um, when people come up with great formats, do you get jealous? Oh my God, all the time. Really? Yeah. I, Tell I, me some. So which are the well, big I, jealous so I, so I think... I think there are ideas sometimes that you have that feel so obvious that you're like, why did no one do this already? Mm. And those are the ones for me that I'm like, oh my God, get me a meeting. I need to go and pitch this. Because you think get me a someone, <laughs> someone's going to think of this. It's in the air. Someone, it, it, It's there for the taking. And when I, when I hear ideas that are such simple formats, I think, uh, or, or worse, where you've, you've flirted around the outside of that idea before and you've gone, oh, I can't quite crack it. I know there's there's, heart, there's, something, there's there. something there, but I can't. I haven't quite given it the thought. And then and then someone else comes in and does it. Oh man, it drives me up the wall. The most recent example of that is um, Richard Bacon has a format with the, the Jimmy Carr hosts. Yes, called I literally just told you. Yes, and it's basically a memory game, but it, it happens uh, as the show's going on. Mm. So you, the the questions in the quiz are about the things that have just happened on the show. So. Two minutes ago, I said a thing about Alex's voice. The next question would be about Alex's voice. Mm. That's such a great idea. So it's simple. so simple. So but simple. It's, but it's the simplest things. Whenever pitching anything, you want to be able to pitch it with under a minute. And someone goes, okay, fine, exactly. I've got it. Yes. I, I mean, you want to minimize the imaginative leap that anyone has to make. Because I think it's, it's weird. You can see something so clearly in your own head. Yeah. But if they can't get to the same place that mm. you're at... It's very frustrating. But what really makes you tick? Because there's. Uh, <laughs> can, yeah. can I just Is say, porn? That's given me a weird, a weird flashback to a barbecue I once went to, <laughs> where um, where I there was a guy there that was odd. You know, there's always someone at a barbecue that's a little bit standing you're like, on his own, <laughs> exactly. In the corner. Well, his opening gambit, mm. and I've never met. You know, normally you're like, "Hi, how are you? Uh, how do you how do you know the people here? You know, what's going on? Are you having a nice day? Those sorts of things." This guy came up and he said, hey, what makes you tick? <laughs> he sounds like he sounds like a character in Murder yeah. Success. And I thought, I thought what? it's like he's planned that. Yeah. He said, he's yeah. like, shit, what do I say? Yeah, um, he's read a Google, he's like Google how to talk to people, ask them what makes them tick. And I thought, what a very profound question, because I don't know. Yeah, it's, yeah. What does make me tick? It's like, it's a very deep question. It's such a podcast question as well. Yeah. Oh, let's get really thoughtful. What makes, what you makes tick? me tick? I thought, what does make me tick? It was a very disarming question. And I and I thought, I've never not thought about it. every couple of weeks I think that's weird that guy said what makes me what does I still know I don't know him? what makes me tick I think I think I said that's a very deep question and I'm gonna have to get back to you because I don't know I don't know what makes it it's not like <laughs> did what? you then just walk come off? back to you hours well, later <laughs> where, where 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 what do you say because you know there are different pillars in my life that make me tick I've got a nice family I like my friends <laughs> I like my job I've got some hobbies they all make me tick. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose making what what makes me really tick. No one's asked you, Jim. No one's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was, that was the Guys. weirdest segue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, make, what yeah. makes me tick? Mm. Yeah, go on, ask no, me. No, go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> someone ask, please. Someone okay. ask Jamie what makes him tick. Go on, someone ask me. Go Jamie on. Lang, yeah. what makes you? Tick? Oh well, uh, what makes me tick? Um, <laughs> I get really thoughtful on it. I think entertaining. <laughs> Talking about yourself, I think, is what makes oh you tick. Oh my god, you've just become David Brent. I think being the <laughs> yeah, funny literally. guy that I am. <laughs> what are you like, Jay? Oh god. Well, I don't know. What is it? Well, because I think, like, I, 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 I don't know what makes me tick. Someone asked me the other day what my fashion sense was, and I was like, oh, it was smart, casual. I didn't really yeah. know what to say. It's quite a hard thing. It's a hard to... thing, yeah. Always wear a beret. That's my fashion <laughs> sense. How long have you been on radio for now? A while, a while, over 10 years. Really? Yeah. It's a long time. Yeah, I've got a, quite a bad autobiographical memory, so any questions about the past, I'm going to struggle with. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, that's really that's good. So, Let's talk about your childhood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my what? <laughs> but that's, because what I find interesting about that is that you, you wake up every single day, you go and do radio, you have to make radio interesting, different, fun, exciting, authentic, um, interesting for the listener. You have to do that on and off. You've done that for over 10 years. That is like you, the constant talking is hard. It, it's tiring, right? You have to constantly entertain. So my question to you is that how do you 
how do you keep the love for that going? Mm. Well, the, the, the love to, to begin with, there was no love for it. <laughs> Genuinely, when I started, I had never done it before, mm. didn't know what I was doing, and had the most extreme version of imposter syndrome anyone's ever had. Because you're there with all the people that you've been listening to on the radio, and then mm. suddenly you're there doing the same job. And I just didn't know what I was doing. Like oh, I was, and I was bad, really bad at it. And thankfully, they they let me be bad for a long time until I got good. And it's the same as anything. If you you know you start something new, you're not going to be thriving at it straight away. Or mm -hmm. if you are, then amazing, you found your your natural talent for something. It was not my natural talent. It took me a long time to feel comfortable doing it. And then I think the more you do something, the more comfortable you you get at it, and you start to realise that. Oh, all the things that were stressful and uh, pressurizing about it, they were just in my head. And actually, if I just turn up and have something that's not too complex an idea, it's going to be the best thing. Because the, I think the best yeah, thing... That's that hard to like accept, because that's like going, okay, fine, let's just accept this moment mm. and just go with... Oh, it took five years. <laughs> it, was not, it, was not, it was not like one day it was bad and then the next day it was good. It was just a slow like erosion of me as a human being until I was like, oh, do you know what? I can't worry about this anymore. And when I stopped worrying and stopped caring, it became, uh, not the stop caring, because I still obviously care about the show, but stop caring about, oh God, what are people going to think of me? Or uh, oh, I've got to have this idea, or this thing wasn't as funny as the thing I did yesterday. Um, that, that, when I let go of that, it became, it became a lot easier. Um, but are you a warrior? Oh my God, I'm the most worried. Yeah, I'm the, I've got so much anxiety coursing through my veins all oh the time. Oh my God, thank God, so yeah. do I. It's just I, brilliant. I, um, yeah, and, and I sometimes meet people who don't worry, and I think... <laughs> What must, your, what must your life be like? Yeah. You don't know how charmed your existence is. Because, you know, I, I, and, and I, think so. that's, I think that's really interesting because from an outside perspective, to look at your life or look at my life, people go, what are they worrying about? They're, they're, you know, they're doing what they like. They've got loads of, spinning loads of plates, loads of stuff going on. But it doesn't, it really doesn't take the worry away, does it? No, it doesn't. And actually, um, I think I typically think that a lot of kind of, I suppose, people who seem to be, um, I don't know, somewhat successful in whatever industry they're doing, typically are the ones who worry a lot because you're so concerned things are going to disappear mm. that you have to keep spinning mm. more and more and more plates, keep going whoa, 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 like that all the time to keep it running always. And I think you're very much like me. We have a, um, our minds overwork. Mm. They, they go all the time. And I find typically at the beginning of the year, January, February for me, Monday, Tuesday of the, the freaking year, um, mine is so hard to slow down. And I know that you're similar that way as well, aren't you? Yeah. So I I, uh, I have a thing called cyclothymia. I know, man. D what is that? Is, What's tell cyclothymia? me all about this. So I only found out about it a couple of years ago, and it explains an awful lot about me. <laughs> so <laughs> I, you suddenly like, ah, oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah, I, I mean, I g genuinely was. So I, uh, I used to think, oh, sometimes I get depressed. Mm. And uh, when I did, it was obviously bad, because depression's pretty bad. And then... Uh, at other times, I would think that I was just my normal self, but I wasn't. I was like the the flip side of the coin of depression, which is slight mania. So if you think about bipolar as being the extremes of kind of hypermania or, or, or manic behavior, mm. often very irrational, off the wall, um, slightly risky behavior, and then at the other end, very, very deep depression. Cyclothymia is a sort of, um, it's sort of, the light version of bipolar. So the, sure. the lows aren't as low and the highs aren't as high. And for me, the highs were channeled in unbelievable superhuman levels of productivity. That's how it, that's <laughs> how it expressed itself. So I used to do things that if I was in a non-cyclothymic state, it would be impossible to do. You know, it, well, it's, explain because just firstly, bipolar and cyclothemia really hard to diagnose. Very hard to diagnose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they are, you know, they're relate, related. My dad, I'm pretty sure, had bipolar, and uh, and th I think th g genetically, it can mm. it can be a thing that if you if you've got a parent or a grandparent who had bipolar, you might have something cyclothymic going on. Um, but what was the productivity like? So, do you, have you have you, do you do you experience a flow state ever? So when mm. you start doing a thing, and which the uh, the other it's the extra bit exactly. When you, you go when, past when you, you get yours masturbating. <laughs> <laughs> five hours in, yeah, finally. Yeah, exactly. I'm right. This is a, I got it. Finally, my flow state. I'm flowing. <laughs> it's flowing everywhere. You oh, get God. it. Masturbating. <laughs> 
I love this idea of slight mania. Is mm. that, does that exist? Is no. that well, just slightly manic today. Well, no, <laughs> it, it sort of is because you, for, for me, it would be um, an in, a sort of intoxicating and overwhelming desire to do some to complete a task, mm. to do a thing. And so, I mean, what have I done? So I, you know, I I make board I make board games as part of my part another part of my life is running a board games company. And sometimes I'll have the idea, you know, I'll be going about my life and the idea will come like, boom, fully formed, this is the board game. And it's like the rest of the world will melt away and I will make that board game and I will do it in 12 hours. Like it will be get made, the prototype will get made. I'll have to design the whole thing in 12 hours. Mm. What? And then... That's a superpower as well. It is a superpower. That's insane. Um, or, you know, like with, with the t- TV ideas, if I have an idea for a TV show, I will be like, oh, there's an idea. I'll book the meeting with the commissioner for like three days time. Yeah. I'll make the presentation. I'll do. I'll cut like a sizzle reel for it. I'll do it all, and it will all happen in a way that um, if I, in my sort of non-up state, were to do it, it would be like a month's work. Mm. But it happens immediately. I can, I'm I not, can sort of relate I'm to not, that. You feel like the task has to be done. Has to be done, And yeah. you can't sleep until it's exactly. done. Exactly. And, and, and everything else in your life sort of fade, fades into, into the distance. And time... Uh, happens incredibly quickly. So it's like it's like you blinked and this thing then exists at the end of it. And I've had it before where um, I've gone back into, you know, like six months later, someone said, oh, we want to revisit that that project. And you go back into the document and I'm like, it's like it was made by someone else. I have no <laughs> idea <laughs> how... <laughs> yeah. Shit, Smith. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it turns out I wasn't that productive. I have <laughs> no idea how to... Um, well, articulate that, a, it almost. Yeah. Well, no, no. How to go back and uh, and and unengineer what I've made. You, yeah. You feel, you're like, wow. Who who was this? Exactly. Person it's like a different person's yeah. made. It's like it's like trying to. It's it's like if you on the day took apart a vacuum cleaner and you were like, I know exactly how to take this apart. And the next day you're like, oh man, someone's taking my vacuum cleaner apart. How do I put it back together? <laughs> it's like it's a bit like that. I just want to credit you, by the way, because I just I think it's so. Um, I just think it's so fantastic that you can sit here and talk about it. Um, because I think a lot of people, uh, firstly, with any disorder, it doesn't matter if it's OCD, insomnia, uh, cyclothemia, whatever it is, people are very scared to talk about these things. And I've said this a million times before on the podcast. I spoke to this guy once and we were talking and we said, we've got to get over this um, stigma of mental health. And he said to me, Jamie, it's so easy for you to say that. Go and go on your podcast, go into the world, go into your workspace and say, you have depression. I label it on yourself. And I went, yeah, I don't really do that. I kind of just say, oh, let's get over it. And now I say, yeah, I'm, I have anxiety. I do. And, I, and I label it on myself. And so what you're doing, and then also I'm like you, you have to make light of the situation and talk about it in such a great way. And that's what you do. And so many people out there will just go, God, thank God I can now talk about how I feel and how I behave and all those different things and how my mind is different. Yeah, well, for me, it was a massive, just a relief to find out about it because, that, because I realized that, um, falling into um, the the up phase of, of cyclothymia, it, it feels very uh, very inviting. It's like walking past Disneyland and there's the parades on and it's open and everything's free and you're going to have the best time. But actually, it's quite destructive for the rest of your life to fall into it. Mm-hmm. And it can also really then lead you into a much deeper depression off the other side. And so my... M- just just knowing that it exists and going, oh, okay, so I'm not just depressed. I've got this thing where I can get a bit, uh, I can I can go off on one a bit, um, was really useful. And I think I had this fear that, uh, oh, well, maybe that's where all my good stuff comes from. What if, what if that's taken away? And mm. and what, I've, what I have uh, learned to do, and sometimes more successfully than others, um, but I've not had, since getting a, the, the diagnosis of cyclothymia, I've not had a off the rails cyclothymic episode because I've been able to go, oh, I can feel it coming and I mm. know what, what I can do to stop myself doing wow, it. But, so you, but can you can still it. harness that creative so, uh, ability. So and yeah, I can drive. get into a flow state um, uh, through choice a bit more now, but it, it takes a while. It, it, it takes like an hour of me like sitting down and starting starting the project. But once I'm in it, I can get so back you, into the flow state. you see state. a hoover and you go, exactly. not today. Exactly. Not today, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, well, I try and think, because sometimes these ideas hit you and you're like, oh my God, I've got to do this now. And I think, do you know what? If I can wait two days when I'm not this super, superhuman version of me and I still think it's a good idea, 
and it's going to be hard work then to do it, then I should do it. I, I swear, to, I, I, mean, I don't know, but I feel like I have something, <laughs> I'm trying to say, I feel like I have something similar. Um, but, I, but I do have this sense where um, I suddenly go into, uh, or not, it's not mania, but I have... Mania is the wrong word for it. I think yeah. mania is more of a, bi, a bipolar, yeah, bipolar thing. thing. Mm. And, and it's, it isn't main... It, in me, it, there's no, if you watch me, there's nothing manic about it. You're not like, oh, this, this person's crazy. You're just like, oh, this person's just got a vision for a project and is mm. bringing it to life. That's, that's what it looks like. It's, yeah, but, it's lucky it manifests in that and mm. not murder or something. Well, exactly. That, that, would, yeah. that would be but, bad. But it's interesting because I, I, when I'm onto something, I almost tunnel vision. 100%. So, this is, so I, and what happens is, is I almost forget that I'm tunnel visioning into that one thing. And then I sort of go, oh shit, I haven't thought about that other stuff that I need to do. Yeah. And then I'll go, okay, fine. And then I suddenly realize, mine don't think is extreme, but I definitely have moments in my life where it will either be, okay, TV formats or podcasting ideas. Charitable or, causes. <laughs> helping the kids. You just can't Climate stop Climate change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I have these moments where I really go into them. And I can, I don't, I'm not very good at completing stuff. Mm. But I, I have definitely moments of huge concentration towards certain mm. things. But I think lots of people possibly yeah, have. Yeah, what, I what, have what, that. what I would say is you are good at completing things. Because look, we're doing a podcast. You've yeah, got, yeah. Uh, you've got uh, TV shows and you've got um, businesses. Yeah. So you are good at completing things. I think sometimes the idea dictates whether it gets completed or not. Sometimes you can, be, you can fall in love with the idea when you first have it. And then time, when that initial burst of enthusiasm wanes, Mm. You you kind of go, oh, maybe this isn't where I should be putting my time. Or worse, it's, another sexy idea comes along. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I want to spend some time with this it's one. It's almost now. like waking up from a dream and in your dream state, you go, oh my God, this is the best exactly, thing ever. Yeah. And then you try and write it down and you're like the badger across the road. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I like, know. what the fuck am yeah. I talking about? This is so but, weird. Uh, but oh, it's so interesting that you said about the fact that you um, were worried that, okay, this is my superpower. What happens if that disappears and that goes and then you're not yourself? Mm. And I think a lot of people have that, whether they take medica medication or thing or anything you know when they sort of harness different scenarios did you have to turn to or do you have to turn to medication with these things no i i haven't done any medication so for me just knowing because as i say i thought i was going to see a doctor because i was depressed and i'd had maybe like three bad bouts of feeling quite depressed in over a 10-year period how long do they last for uh, I mean, they they varied. At the worst, we're talking like six months, and it's not yeah. it's not um it's very it's extremely functional depression. Like it wasn't that depression that you hear of that my dad definitely had, which is like couldn't get out of bed. It was it was like nobody would know. I could I would I could come and do this podcast. You guys would have no idea. I could go and do the radio show. You'd have no idea. But it would just be a low level feeling of like everything's not okay mm. and I'm and I can see no joy or hope or you know yeah. pleasure in the world um but it was never debilitating to the point where I couldn't function for me but it is hard to get by with, with. yeah um and so uh, we yeah, went to see the the doctor about that and they they said well tell us about the rest of the time and I was like well the rest of the time I'm amazing I'm on fire and and the the other thing that would that happened was I would book to see a doctor when I was depressed and then I would come out of the depression and I'd be in an upstate and I'd be like, oh, I've booked him to see the doctor. <laughs> you'd go and do his job for him. You'd exactly. Like, Step aside. Well, no, you'd I've go into the doctor and say, ah, is the, that was another guy's problem. Like it was, it was like another thing, another thing that went, and it was then someone saying, oh, there's this thing where you can have both of those, those things. And maybe you should try not to, if you can feel the cyclothymic um, uptime coming, Maybe you should not go into it because it might control the other thing. So the, yeah, two, wow. two things helped. So one was, okay, what can I do when I feel the anxiety or depression coming on? And uh, your brain tells you, oh my God, uh, you should do something that's productive because the reason you're feeling like this is because you're not productive enough, but actually you don't have the energy to be productive and you haven't got any ideas and maybe you'll never have an idea ever again. And oh my God, it's all gone. So the thing that is, feels counterintuitive because your brain is going to bully you about it, for me, is distract. Do something that is so such sensory overload that I can't actually have the space to worry. And for me, it was teaching myself how to produce music from from doing nothing. Wow. So that was like my my thing. I was like, I can go and do that. I, nothing has to come of it. I can fail at it, but you're never going to fail. If you if you press a key on a keyboard and a sound comes out, you haven't failed. And so it feels like I'm doing a thing. Oh. And that for me 
immediately, when I feel it bubbling up, I go and do that. And an hour later, I'm like, oh, I'm back it's, to myself. It's an amazing outlet. It's like a creative process yeah. as well. It's so yeah, it's like, it's, it's like tricking your brain into thinking you're doing something creative and productive. And in a way you kind of are, but there's no... And then, and then you play it back. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but but that's, a, that's amazing to have that kind of, um, that self-control over your self-mind and situation. Well, I mean, uh, when generally when you, I feel anxious or worried about something, the initial trigger is like, fight or flight. Oh my God, the, the world's going to end. Like, <laughs> You're like, do you run like me? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I, I'm just a catastrophizer. Everything always is like a domino effect in my brain. It's like, well, hang on, because that didn't happen, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And it always ends like, and you're living under a bridge now. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're homeless. Yeah, you're living under a bridge. And someone that you know from your past walks by and go, Jamie, is that you? <laughs> yeah. Is that you, Jamie? <laughs> Down there, let me just put this on the east. No one's gonna believe it. Guys, come over here. James under a bridge. He was doing so well. Always, it's just always homeless. And then is that or I've died. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's always where it leads. And, and when I feel like coming up now, I just know. Just get me to a synthesizer. I was going to say, do you have to carry a, <laughs> carry a board <laughs> around with you? Just to see you furiously like tapping away, like, yeah, you must be having one but of like, those episodes. But, but, <laughs> genuinely, yeah. I have GarageBand on my phone and I can, I can, come, I can, I write four chords and then wow. I just loop it and I'll just mess around with stuff. But that right. is just insane. Listen, we've got to stop there for part one. I want to continue this conversation in part two. Leave us on a cliffhanger. You're good at radio. Oh God, what's a cliffhanger? <laughs> well, l when you find out what I did with some of those songs, <laughs> it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> See you in part two. <laughs> oh God, yes. Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of Private Parts. Still here with Matt Edmonds. Ah, it's Private Parts. I was about to do a little intro and I forgot what it was. What is it? Oh, this is the podcast where nothing's off limits. There you it's go. good that. You yeah. like that? Yeah. I forgot You're it. You're only about 700 episodes in. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a new, it's a it's new a catchphrase. New. Oh, fine. Thousands <laughs> of pounds are spent on that. <laughs> and he's absolutely <laughs> spaffed it up the wall. Yeah. We've got a new green screen as well, yeah. actually. So. <laughs> I don't know why he messes Just up. love spending money. <laughs> yeah. He loves it. But um, so I was going to say, my, you know, I get really bad anxiety. And actually what I find quite cathartic is talking about these sorts of things. And this is why I really enjoy um, talking about it on the podcast because I find it such a way to release stuff. But my, when I get my anxiety, when my anxiety is really heightened and it's, it's really sort of got its grip on me, as soon as that releases, I almost get a low mood after that because mm. my adrenaline's almost dropped down. Do you ever get things like that? Yeah, so my my uh, almost every low mood I've I've ever experienced has been triggered by something that's had that domino effect anxiety thing, and they can be very very silly things like oh I sent an email and the person replied in a way that makes me think that they don't like me and oh yes. my god it's ah and then it cascades from there or like uh. Oh, I've been, I've had it before where I've been working on a project and then a similar thing gets commissioned elsewhere and you're like, oh no, well, my idea is never going to happen. In my brain, that idea was the thing that was going to set me up for life. Oh God, what's going to happen? All, all those sorts of things. So, um, and, and then it's, 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 it, it is, it's not even rare. It doesn't happen for me that I just wake up one day and I'm like, I'm down. There's always a trigger, trigger. Mm. always something that's like, uh, and, 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 and it, and it spirals off. And that's where the intercepting that and recognizing, oh, I've got that thing where I'm like, I've got anxiety coursing through my body. Mm -hmm. So my options are I can sit and play the game with my own head of what if -ery, or I can just do something else. That's a good game show, actually. Yeah, what yeah. Oh, yeah. We've got to hear, you don't understand how Matt's board games, all of his ideas, they're just insane. Firstly, you, you, you teed us up for it, so and, and knock it out of the park. What did you do with the music? So, um, so I, I never... I'd never done anything musical before. I mean, yeah. I can barely clap in time. I always got told off in the audience of The X Factor <laughs> by the guy who's doing the warm up because I was clapping out of time. You know, when everyone's like, hey, hey, and I was off beat. And he came up and he was like, mate, you're, throw you're throwing everyone off. <laughs> and so my rhythm is quite bad. Um, and obviously, play songs on the radio and like, like, yeah. obviously, like music. I wouldn't be doing the job I'm doing if I didn't. Can't sing, never learned an instrument. And I had this experience 
And uh, I reckon Jamie's absolutely going to relate to this. I relate, I'm relating to you everything relate, you're yeah, saying. I'm, it's like I'm trying to steal your thunder, but I'm not. Uh, no, I, I had this experience where I, I went for the radio to a, uh, to a recording studio. You know the guy, Example, the mu- musician? Yeah. So I went to, he had a studio uh, over in uh, Wandsworth and this guy, Andy Sheldrake, who's his producer, who's a very unassuming but incredibly talented man. Mm. And we were doing a joke song for the radio. And I went in and... Uh, uh, Elliot, example, was running a bit late, so I was there with Andy, and I was like, "Look, here's the here's the thing. We've got this 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 kid sent in like them going. Duh, 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 duh. We're going to turn it into a song." And he loaded in this file of this kid going, duh, 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 duh. and then he turned to a synthesizer next to him, and he <laughs> played one note, right, one bass note, mm. and I was like, "Oh my god, it's a song." Oh my God. And then he played another note and I was like, oh my God, it's a song. And then he added a kick drum. Doom, 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 doom. I was like, oh my God, we're in a re- This is crazy. Mm-hmm. And I said, I can hear this thing that's doing like a... Mm. And he's like, yeah, that's, a, that's an arpeggiator. Mm. Let me put it in. And so he put it in and I was like, oh my God, I've been chasing this feeling my whole life of I've thought of a thing and it's in the real world. And you know what it's like, right? You think, oh, I want to do a sweet company. It takes years to do. Yeah. You've got to go and make the sweets. Or I want to make a TV show. Oh, I've got to hire like a hundred people and make a TV show. And I have to compromise along the way. Or I want to make a podcast. Oh God, I've got to get all these people in a studio and all that sort of stuff. I have to get Alex Mitten involved. <laughs> Whereas this, is, this was like, I think it, and it exists, te- like a second later. I just thought of like, oh, can I have a string, some strings that go, dum, 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 dum. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, sure, in it comes. And I was like, oh my God, this is like crack to me. Yeah, yeah. This is, it's that instantaneous, instantaneous yeah. like, gratification it's, that it's, comes there. It's the, it's the download, like, you know, for me making a board game, I can get it out of my head in 12 hours, but then I've got to, I've got to get it to a distributor. I've got to get a, pitch it into retailers. I've got to get it manufactured. It's going to be in a boat for three months. By that point, it's like, oh God, it's not, I'm I've never been less right excited yeah. by this now. <laughs> Whereas this is like, think it and it appears. It's, mm. like, it's, it's like magic. Wow. And so I left there and, and he, he said the worst thing that anyone could ever say to me, which he, he said, because uh, I wrote all the lyrics for this, this song. Mm. He said, have you done this before? I was like, no. And he goes, you're really good at that. The the lyrics, the melody. He was like, not many people can do that. You really, you should do this again. And I was like, cool. Well, I'm free tomorrow. Should I come back? <laughs> I know, and he that said, was liquid gold to you. Yeah. Wasn't it? And he yeah. said, he said, uh, I mean, yeah, you can if you want. So I went back the next <laughs> no, day without example there, with just me and this producer. And I was like, so tell me everything. I'm here to I'm here to absorb everything about this. And then I I bothered this guy. You know, this guy's got a job, right? I bothered bothered him maybe every day for about three months, where I was like when can I come in this week? He's like, I'm actually quite busy on a project. I'm mixing a record. Can I come and watch you do it? And so I'd sit there in this room and I'd just watch him do stuff. And so I'd say, annoying. what's that? And he'd be like, it's an equalizer. It's an EQ. What does it do? Oh, it's sort of, it's quite hard to explain what it does, but okay, here's the explanation. And everything he put on, every, every single thing, I was like, I have to learn this. And I, I, I went, Wow. I fell so hard in love with it. I was like, I need to learn how to do this. And so from that point, every day I was like, all I did was watch YouTube videos of mm. like nerds saying, here's <laughs> how a compressor works. And uh, I was like, cool, well, I'm going to learn all this stuff. And, and again, remember, I can't play an instrument and I can't, I, I don't know what wow. music, I don't I know any music, but I was like, I'm going to make a song. I'm going to start making some songs here. And so, and then lockdown happened and I thought, well, I've been looking for some time for this. <laughs> Suddenly I've got some. Suddenly I've loads. The universe has delivered some time. Why <laughs> don't I mean? try this? Yeah. And so in probably... In your head, were you like, this is a sign. Well, well, exactly. Yeah. It would have been, yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, at that point, I was like, and I was definitely sort of in a, maybe a more of an up phase. <laughs> in a flow stage. I was like, <laughs> why don't I? I was like, I'm never going to do this unless um, my feet are held to the fire. Why don't I DM? loads of pop stars and see if they want to make a song with me. And so I did. And amazingly, they said yes. No way. And so I recorded it as a podcast called Not Another Love Song. And I made an album from never writing anything before. I made an album in lockdown with 10 of the best pop stars in Britain. No so way. people like James Arthur, Griff, Holly Humberston, Becky Hill, Sigrid, all of them came on. And, that is amazing. And, and, yes. we, and I didn't even know if I could write a song because I'd never done it before. We wrote a song together. So you hear us chatting, mm. writing a song. 
And then I went off and produced it, having never produced a song before. And the first one I did was with Maisie Peters, and it took me three months to make because I didn't like the, the song. Mm. I didn't know what I was doing. Imagine you ne- you don't know what you're doing, right? Never done it before. It's like someone saying, go and build a conservatory from scratch off the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I promised Maisie <laughs> Peters in three months that there's going to be a conservatory. <laughs> Uh, so, so, uh, so I did that, and, and then of course, once you've done one, you're like, okay, I'll I, the next one. I'm takes pretty a month. good at this now. Well, the next one takes a month, and the next one takes two weeks, and mm. then the last one took a day, you know. Uh, and so, um, and so, yeah, that was, uh, and that, that and is that, amazing. That really helped with the anxiety because I was like, well, at any point, I'm feeling anxious. I was like, cool, I'll just go and work on this song. Did, did you release them? Yeah, so it's at, well, not as an album, but it's, okay. you can hear them all in the podcast. So, you, so you you hear us having a chat like we are yeah, now, yeah. and then there's uh, that's a really clever and then podcast. You hear us writing the song, and it, it was about it had to be about something that had come up in conversation, mm-hmm. and it had to be something they'd never written about before. So the, all the songs are kind of wow. stupid. So there's like one about. Um, a dishwasher that I did with Tom Walker. Tom Grennan's one's about high intensity training. Becky Hill's one's about Dr. Pimple Popper, the woman who pops uh, spots on TikTok. Um, and uh, what's it called? The podcast? It's called Not Another Love Song. That is genius. Thanks. Thanks. I don't know, that, that needs way more. Well, we're talking about it now. No, I know, but that is a fantastic way to not only co- I, I always think combining different things how do you and you're combining so many different mm. mediums together to create well it's a thing that i've never heard before which is yeah. two people that don't know, know each other collaborating on something and trying to make it good and you know what collaborations like you um you know sometimes you don't think the other person's idea is very good so no. you try and build on it and then they try and build on that and it's it's a very democratic process where the best idea comes to the top and that I've sort of captured that process because even though we're writing a joke song, they want it to be good because mm. they've got to go and record a vocal and send it to me and I want it to be good. And, um, and you, so you hear that and then you also hear me going, right, well, how do you make a house record or how do you make a kind oh of like God. acoustic... Uh, acoustic record and all the stuff I've learned along the way because I didn't, you know, genuinely had no idea. I think that's genius. Honestly, I truly believe what the appetite for people right now um, is... It, that, that everyone goes, I don't actually mind the word people, I hate the word. That journey, you want to take people on a journey, mm. right? This is why people like true crime or they like, uh, you know, Tinder Swindler stuff, because you're being led on this sort of authentic, real journey that's going on. That podcasting is going down that route of, and you've done exactly that. You 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 have a beginning, middle, and end. Hopefully, the end's going to be great. Or if it isn't great, no, that's the end. What, what makes that, even better. That's the thing, because at the end, because I, I, I would not let anything go out. That, I mean, I spent literally two years working on it, so I would not no let way. anything go out that I thought sucked. And sometimes I listen back to it, I'm like, oh, I wish I'd EQ'd that differently, or I wish I'd done something slightly differently. But, but I, for, for who I was and the, the skills that I had at that time, mm. it's like an amazing record of my growth, wow. song to song. Yeah. Do you think you're a perfectionist? Yeah, 100%. Without a doubt. Is, does that get in the way sometimes? Uh, sometimes. I, 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 I've, I've sort of hit a thing this year where there's too much going on. So I'm like, I'm a good ideas person and I'm sometimes a good executor, but I'm much better at going, I've had the idea, I've sold the idea, let me find someone more talented to do the thing. Mm. And um, that's hard if you're a control freak because you're, you, you sometimes think like, I want to do it. But like I've got, um, I've got a... TV show and production that's an idea of mine. Me and my mate from school, we came up with an idea and, and got it away. But it's like right now, people are making decisions about it in another place that isn't here. Yeah. And I'm going to have to pop in and see them and say, so how's my baby doing? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Clutching your keyboard. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> and, and, and I'm le- this year is my, my year of trying to learn to let go. And like the same with the board you game, to, same yeah. with the board games thing. Like I set up in lockdown, same time as making this album, set up a board games company. And my brother-in-law went yesterday and did like a distribution deal for it because I Man, couldn't do it. Dude, honestly, congrats. Thanks. Most people go, oh, I go, okay, I'm um, okay, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. They have ideas and they go, oh, and everyone always goes, ah, I had that idea. Mm. People who actually go and do it are the ones who succeed. Firstly, that, but secondly, um, yeah, I, I, for, coming from a bit of a control freak as well, th- you have to let other people take over. And that is the hardest thing. One of the hardest things for me ever was to hire a PA. Mm. I have someone called Freya now. <laughs> it's a tough I mean, life. That is the most Jimmy life ever. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's, it's he's sad. had his struggles, are, are guys. You, are you okay? No, You're right. No, one, the one of the hardest, hardest things, things ever. Right, right, right. Why, was it, why was it so hard? No, yeah. but okay. Come on. 
I, do, I need, do I need to bring in a synthesizer and get a tiny violin up? Yeah, yeah. Play some strings for me. Let's go. Yeah. Um, no, my point was, it's not the hardest thing ever, but it was it was difficult because... <laughs> Please, I, can we put some slight like really low violin music to them? <laughs> but the point, no, it's more the point that it was it was the fact that I was letting someone else control a bit of my life. Mm. And that's what a PA does. They they book things, they sort things, they tell you yes and no, they say- Are, what? You, are you saying as though we wouldn't know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fuck one, you one, guys. One I would, I'd <laughs> love a PA. I would absolutely love a PA. Shut it's so up. Good. You can all have one. If you're struggling, by all means, I'm happy to take some of your PA's time. <laughs> <laughs> I got quite a lot, quite a lot that I've got going. You've on. got a lot going on. You should, but it's but it was more the fact that I'm a bit I'm a control freak, and so I thought I could do the job better than anyone else. Mm. And 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 actually, the um sort of road to success in a certain way is believing, realizing that actually you're not the best person to do every job. Yeah, and de and dedicating jobs to other people to do. So with your TV show idea, it's so true. You go, well, that's my baby. They're doing it wrong, and how they're doing this, and you can get really irritated and annoyed. But actually, you have to have the faith that they're doing it right. Yeah. Well, for me, like the the idea of collaboration has been a a, a big shift for me in the last couple of years because mm. I was very like uh, singular in what I was doing, mm. and it, and it came from I think. Back in the day, like early part of my career, I worked for this company called Holy Moly and I, I did all their video stuff and all I did everything. Like I remember I, Holy Moly. I did all, I booked the guests, I did the interviews, I did the edit and I love being in control of the edit because it's like, if I make a stumble or something I don't like, I'll be like, cool, I can spend an hour <laughs> borrowing like a frame from there and a frame from here to make a perfect blend. So it seems like I've not messed up. <laughs> and it was like, as you know, I had just ultimate control over it. And I found it hard going to Radio 1. It's like, oh, here's a producer. I was like, why do I need a producer? Yeah. I've been producing myself for five years and then you realize oh no actually it's great to collaborate and then when molly joined the show it was like oh my god it's so much better having someone else here mm. to to spark off and uh, collaborate with and then when the the board games thing came out because I, I i invent i've invented them for years and i've always licensed them out to other companies and that's been okay because it's like okay i've given you the idea and and they've always done an amazing job at doing it and it was like i don't have to think about it but when it was like, oh, it's my own, I'm going to do it. It was re. I, I would never have got it off the ground if my brother-in-law hadn't said, you know, all those ideas you got sat in that box there. What about if I did it? Did it? Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, the, fine. The board games are just fascinating. And I remember speaking to you a few years ago about it because I, there's a... Um... You you work with a company I think called Big Potato. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they they license a couple of my yeah, a couple of mine. Coming in, but now you realise that actually the the real sort of uh, owning the whole thing and doing it all. What is your what is the company called that you've just set up? It's called Format <laughs> Games. And okay, explain the, the the games that you come up with are wild. <laughs> Like, it, it's almost like you've gone into a room and gone, Bruh! and then it sort of comes together. Well, that's probably your flow state that you've gone yeah, into. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one to explain how you come up with an idea for anything, I think. And often it's like the, the nugget of the idea materialises and you think, oh, that's good, but it's not complete yet. Mm -hmm. And for me, it can be like two weeks later or two years later when suddenly the other half of it comes, you're like, boom, that's it. Those two ideas, those two bits together make a whole idea. And then at that point, it feels like it already exists. And I just have to, I'm just the person bringing it to life. So yeah, with the, um, with the, the games company, again, it started in lockdown as a sort of weird experiment. And it was just a way to keep myself busy because I had, I make a show called Dress to Impress, which is like a d dating show shot in shopping centers. Mm. And because of COVID, we were about to do a series of it. It went away. So I, all the time I was about to do, I spent on that, I now had clear in my diary. I thought, God, if I sit at home, I'm going to go insane. Mm. So I, that's when I thought, well, I'll make an album. Great. That'll cover some of the time. And then the rest of the time I thought, well, I'll do the board. I'll try and do one of these board games and had this idea, which had been sat in a drawer for years. That I'd never done anything with called uh, Ansagrams or Answergrams, which is like, an answer and an anagram. Very, very simple quiz idea, trivia game, where you'd be, you'd ask five questions, you'd only write down the first letter of the answer. And then you'd have, you know, five letters written down, which you'd unscramble, countdown mm. conundrum style to make a word. Whoever gets the word first wins a card. Great. I was like, that's a good format there. <laughs> Let's do it. So I just, I thought, well, I'll see if I can write it. So I wrote it in like two days. And, um, and, uh, and I'd done that pre-lockdown. I just had it in a drawer. And my my brother-in-law ran a cleaning company, which also w didn't wasn't on the first. You remember the first lockdown? Like mm. you couldn't see anyone do anything, mm. so you couldn't send cleaning cleaning people out to people's homes. So he was like, "Oh man, I need something to do." And I said, "Well, I got this game," and he said, "Okay, if I can figure out how to get it made, if you can if you can design it, 
because yeah. he's not a technical guy, nor am I really. I was like, I reckon I can learn this on YouTube. So I, I, wow. I, I learned um, Illustrator, you know, mm. Adobe Illustrator off the internet. Are you mad? That is, what? But it's, it's all there. No, it, I know, but it's the dedication to the... T well, I like the trial and error of it. I like going into the software and going, I don't know what to do, but I reckon that button's got a pen on it. So I reckon that might make me draw something. And you spend an hour messing up and you're like, oh, now I know what... It, oh, you watch a YouTube video. Like, oh, now I know what that does. Mm. Okay, well, I've, I've now been able to draw a circle. Okay, well, now I need some words on there. Okay, well, that one's got... That's the... That's a T, that's a font thing. And so, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was stressful because mm. I didn't know what I was doing. And I would not, I would not ask anyone else for help on it. I was mm. like, I'm going to just do it. And it took maybe a month to make this answer game. And if you saw it, you go, how did that take a month? It's quite a simple design. Wow. But we, we got it made, got it manufactured, and we, we, uh, we went to sell them. We tried to sell them on Amazon. Yeah. And Amazon was like, hey, you're a new company, so we don't trust you. Yeah, okay. And uh, also, um, it's Christmas, so uh, we're, we're our, our shelves are full. And also, we're in a pandemic, so everyone's using Amazon. So you can stock 20 of your product with us. And we were like, ah, we've ordered thousands. <laughs> Minimum order would have been three. <laughs> so what, what are we going to do here? So we put some of them on Amazon, and every time we put 20 up, boom, they'd go. They'd go. Wow. And Amazon, the Amazon algorithm goes, okay, people want this game. Yeah, so it's yeah. like, the next day, like, it will take 50. Boom, 50 go. Okay, well, the next day, you can have 200. Boom, 200 go. So the next day, you can have, all right, we'll give you 500. And then, but it, we, we couldn't get enough. So we sold them via Etsy to yeah. begin with. And my brother-in-law did all of the distribution from his kitchen. So he was like, literally printing off people's addresses, sticking them on envelopes, and going to a post office That's with like fun. bags of thousands of games and holding up the post office queue at Christmas oh, when people gosh. were trying to send stuff. And he was like there at the post office for two hours. <laughs> as they're like, there's another game. Yeah, another one. Yeah, another one. Another one. Because we didn't know what we were doing. God. And then and then off the back of that, we were like, okay, we'll get a, we'll get a distributor and we'll, we'll figure it out. And it went from like this little accidental fun project to oh my god now we're running this business. Well, so how many how many games have you sold now? So we're just about to sell a hundred thousand games. That yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah, and that's just in the UK. We've just done a deal with America now. Oh my god! And and then so they're going they're going over there, and we have seven games now. So that was that was only a year and a half ago. Answer grounds. So since then we did a game called So Wrong It's Right, which became one of the top ten best selling games in the country last year. Um, we did a game called Egg Slam, which I invented with yeah. my daughter, Ivy. Um, and then this year, we've got three new ones coming out. So we've got a game called Noggin, which is, and I swear to God, the best game I've ever played. And I know I came up with it, but honestly, it's <laughs> the best it. game I've ever played. I could play it all day, every day. It's, it's the best game you'll ever play. Can you give us an insight into what it is? Yeah, so it, it's not sexy to describe, but once you play it, it's amazing. Mm. So imagine that we all get a little stack of cards mm. and those cards are full of letters of the alphabet and then these action cards. And there are three piles and we're all going to deal cards onto these piles. So it'll be like, you know, you deal a J, I deal an A, you deal an M, I deal a B. So let's say, for the sake of it being easy, that we land and it's, it's an M for Matt, an A for Alex, and a J for Jamie, right? And the um, the one of these action card comes out and it goes on top of the M. So now we're just left with a J and an A. Now that action card is going to ask, because there are seven action cards, going to ask us to do something with the letters J and A. So mm. it might say, come up with um, a word that starts with a J and ends with an A. So like... Um, uh. Mm, that's a Jakarta. One. Yeah, perfect. It's great. Right. So you would say Jakarta and you would win that card. Mm. But let's say that same J and A are out and another action card comes out. Now it wants one where a J and an A are in the middle of a word. Oh my God, this is amazing. And, and then maybe another card comes out and it wants uh, a word that doesn't have a J or an A in it. Oh my God, I freaking love this. Or another one comes out and it wants a celebrity with the initials AJ or JA. James Arthur. AJ Tracy. AJ Tracy. It uh, doesn't work. <laughs> Anthony Joshua. Perfect. Oh my God. Whoever gets their phone. Oh my God, let's play. Let's or, play yeah. or a card would come out and it'd say, it would say, give me two words that have a connection, one beginning with J and one beginning with A. So you could say like, uh, jumper arm, because you put your arm into a jumper. Then it might say, the card come out saying, give me two words that don't have a connection. So you might say, uh, uh, jungle and America, because there isn't a, a jungle in America. Or there's another card that might come out and say, give me a description of uh, something that starts with a J and an A. So you might say like uh, a jumping alpaca 
or an angry oh my god this is bang- joystick how, how do you so what, what's the aim of the game so the aim of the game <laughs> the aim of the game is as these action cards come out the first person to think of it so say ja comes out and you yeah. say anthony joshua you win that action card so and whoever's got the most action cards at the end wins the game so yeah. simple so simple honestly it's it's the most intense brilliant it takes like 10 minutes to play but then you want to go again and no game's ever the same I, ha, what makes a good game so for me, it's not something that's uncomplicated. That I, I can explain the rules to you. Like you just imagined playing mm-hmm. Noggin and now we could play it. Something that's so simple. You're like, oh, it's a quiz that leads to an anagram. Great, got it. The last thing I want is someone opening one of my games up and going, oh my God, look how long these instructions yeah. are. Oh, someone's got, got the job of like, oh, I've got to explain this mm. to my friends. I want it to be the, the like simplicity and that it's like snackable. I want it to be a thing where we're not invested for two hours in this thing. Like, it's not like, oh, let's get Monopoly out. We're going to be here for days. It's, <laughs> yeah. we can play this for 10 you, minutes and if we love it, we'll play another round. You need round. to be able to play a hammered, basically. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Okay, but then um, what is, the, none of your games, what's the greatest game? ever invented oh now that's an interesting one um obviously noggin is the answer um (laughs) none of your games you're none of my games the greatest game ever invented i'm going to give you two answers can i say one of them go on uno uno's a great game it is a great game can i give you another one one go on boggle Mm. Bog, very, you've got a very mainstream taste. Oh Jamie. my god! What are your little oh, let's? Say, I want to hear some niche, edgy ones. Some niche, so, East so London. niche games. Uh, okay, there. Are... Okay, here's one. Linky. Linky's great. If you like Linky, you like Answergrams. Snatch. Basically the same thing, but with an played Snatch. Snatch is good. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's good. It's, right. a, it's, a, it's a it's a it's a public school. Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so some if people want to try a game that is that is if you want to go this is the opposite of what I just said, right? If you want one that's like crazy rules, mm. but once you get into it, it's amazing. There's a game called Cult Express, and it is it's oh god, it sounds so bad when I explain it. <laughs> it's a uh, you, it's set in a western on a train two levels of a train. You have a train in 3D that you build and you are a bandit against loads of other bandits trying to gain treasure and money and gems and things that have been scattered around this train. But the whole idea is you you sort of code your scene and then you act it out. Mm. So I'd be like, I'm going to jump from this carriage to that carriage. I'm going to try and punch someone if they're in that carriage. And if I punch them, they're going to drop some money and I'm going to pick that money up. But you're that other like person. A, it's like, like a puzzle. puzzle. It's like a yeah, puzzle. But, but you're trying to play against what you think other people will do. So I'll be like, I think, ja- I, think, good. I think Jamie's probably going to go for that, that gemstone. He's laying his card before me. I think he's going to pick it up. I know if I throw a punch, I'll hit him. He'll drop that gemstone. And so now on my next go, I might do it. But he might know I'm going to throw a punch. So he might then lay his next card as, oh, I'm going to pick up a thing. So you're, it's like this it's psychological game of chess. It's, it's a game of chess, chess, but happening in this 3D yeah. train. The rules, though, are painful. <laughs> Sounds very flow state. <laughs> okay. yeah. just, but, but, if you want, but if you want an easy one, there's a game called Gobbit, a French game. Gobbit. Oh, oh, nice. oh, oh my God, it's so good. It's, um, <laughs> it's a game where you are uh, a predator. I can't remember what they are. It's been ages since I've played like a snake, a butterfly and a fly or something like that. And I oh know it's a snake, a... Um, a uh, uh, what do you call it? A um, <laughs> chameleon and a fly. <laughs> yeah. So the snake can eat the chameleon. The chameleon can eat the fly. The fly can't eat anything. Yeah. And you can only eat the same color animal that you are. So if you're a red uh, chameleon, you can eat a red fly, but you can be eaten by a red snake. Mm-hmm. And so you deal these cards out and there are different colors. And so it's this amazing, like, sm- very aggressive, hand slammy, I'm trying to attack you, you're trying to defend yourself game. It's so simple and so good. And if we played it now, you'd it's all you'd ever play. It's oh so good. Oh my God, I love this. Yeah. What I find amazing though is, is your... Um, you have so much going on and so much you're juggling. You don't drink, do you, Matt? Don't drink. You've never drank. Never drank. Explain this. So uh, so if you'd have met me 10 years ago and said, why don't you drink? I think the answer I would have given is, well, I'm a bit of a control freak. And I don't like the idea of taking something that's going to make me feel different to how I am. And there is mm. truth in that. But also, my dad was an alcoholic. And I only realised it sounds strange to say, but I only came to realise that in my in the last sort of five years. And I look back and go, oh yeah, it makes so much sense mm. that maybe I had a distrustful relationship of alcohol or I felt very responsible as a kid. And so the idea of me drinking would probably not be, it was not an attractive proposition to me. But, but for years I was like, I think it's just the, a control thing for me. I'm also a really fussy eater. And so... I've never, I've also never had like Coca-Cola because- oh, Have you not? No, because I, I, there's something about 
the look and the smell and the sound of it, I'm like, ah, not for me. And I feel the same about alcohol. I don't like how it looks. I don't like how it wow. smells. Um, and so, yeah, so I've, so, I've, so I've never drunk. So yeah, I don't know what it is to be drunk or hungover. And I think, how do people do it? Because I, sometimes I wake up and I'm really tired. I think, God, how do people do this hungover? Yeah, how do they add true. to this? And, 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 it, and it's crazy what the... Um what alcohol does to your body. I mean, how it dehydrates you and stuff like that. Is your, is your dad alive? He's not, no. How he, did he pass away? He killed himself. Oh man, I had no yeah. idea. So he, he, he took his own life when I was 20. Oh after, my God. After a very, you know, I said, I think he had bi bipolar. Mm. And he, I mean, he as a kid definitely was an alcoholic when we were kids. But um, he would have these big... Um, manic episodes and sort of what you were talking about earlier, like the, the proper mania mania mm. where he would disappear and do wild, crazy things. Um, and then, yeah, he, he got into a really deep depression, like the sort of depression that I, I hope to never come anywhere near to where he could really not function. Like couldn't get out of bed, couldn't go to work, couldn't do anything. Like the world was just a dark, dark just place. No joy. Mm. No joy. Nothing. And he was drinking and drinking secretly as well. We, we thought he'd stop for a while, but he, he, uh, he wasn't. And yeah, he took his own life when I was, mm, I think I was tw maybe 22, 20, oh, yeah, must have been 22. God. And, uh, you know, uh, just <sighs> an awful, an awful, awful time. I, I mm. had, um, I had dinner with my sister-in-law last night and her dad died when she was 22. And it's a real important age for anyone because mm. it's the age where you need someone to lead you. Mm. You know, it, it, so you're 22 is where you're going into adult life and you sort of need that sort of structure and that sort of leadership um it's yeah a, it's I, mean, a, it's I, I mean i definitely didn't have that from even from like from teenagers my yeah. dad you know because of his his alcoholism um but he's a difficult he was a difficult man but i suppose we had this question before and, and alex uh alex has spoken about this. alex's mum died and uh it's how do you deal with grief so uh i i didn't deal with it well uh, is the honest answer i i ran from it and i hid from it and um, I was very angry. I think a lot of people who've experienced uh, suicide are often very angry at the person mm. for leaving you, uh, for doing that. To, it feels like a, it feels like it's a, I mean, it's a very violent thing to do to yourself. They have ki literally killed themselves. Mm. And you think you've done that and you've, you've left my mom in a situation where she's had to deal with the fallout of that. And I'm angry. And um, I, I held a lot of anger. And what I did was bury it all deep. And I went, do you know what? The easiest thing to do is just go back to my, my life. And the story I told myself was, do you know what? I found him difficult. Uh, at times I didn't like the guy and uh, uh, life goes on. Yeah. Come back to my normal life. And then it wasn't until I started therapy, sort of early 30s. And they were like, so, you know, tell us about your family. Tell, and I was, tell us about your childhood. And they're like, oh, you classic <laughs> therapist. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was, like, I was expecting that? that one. I thought you were going to ask me yeah. what makes me tick. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I was like, okay, well, and I said, well, you know, it was a quite a happy childhood and I uh, didn't have much going on. And she's like, tell me about your family. Well, I was like, I mean, my mum lived down the road from me, my sister, very close to, you know, my dad killed himself. So there's not much to say there. And she was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Already <laughs> brushing over yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, um, and at, at that point, she was like, well, we should talk about that more. And I was like, honestly, there's, there's absolutely nothing to go to. I'm oh, fine. And then, of course, like three questions later, I'm a, in a ball of tears. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Uh, this grief finally coming up. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, so it took a while to kind of work through that stuff. And actually, uh, the, the other thing that happened for me in lockdown with the music was the very first song I ever wrote was a song about my dad because my therapist had asked me to write a letter to my dad and I'd put it off for months, couldn't do it. And then I found myself trying to learn like piano basically in, mm. in, in lockdown. And I wrote these chords and I thought, okay, I'll, um, I'll try and write something to this. No intention of writing anything about my dad. And I wrote this line. I was like, oh, that's sort of how I felt about my dad. And then I wrote the next line. I was like, oh, that, I'm now, I'm now I'm writing this song about my dad. And it came out in like 10 minutes. And I, uh, I, I made it and I shared, I sat on it for six months. I didn't play it to literally anyone. Didn't, I, I got my friend Amy to sing on it. So I had to tell her about it because she had mm. to sing it. Um, and then uh, I put it on, I put it on Twitter and it just went like crazy with the, with the, the response to it from people who had either had parents who were alcoholics or who were themselves alcoholics or who had lost someone to suicide. And, uh, and yeah, it was an amazing, amazing sort of thing. Like, 
the only serious song I've ever written really was like was was that. I guess like unpackaging it through art is such a nice way of doing it because you're kind of like indirectly directly dealing with it. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, but also I, I felt at the time it wasn't like a conscious effort. It was just it was just it ha it just sort of happened. And I'd spent years avoiding sitting in a room thinking about it. My worst nightmare was to sit in a room and think about your dad. Yeah. And then that's what I did for a whole afternoon. And it was it was it was like a weird time because lockdown is a weird time anyway. There was like something in the air that was very mm. unsettling of like, mm. oh, we're all prisoners in our own homes and what's happening with the what we didn't know anything about the virus. And it was like in that moment I I, I thought and for whatever reason, it just ha it just sort of happened. It's amazing. You, we spoke about that sort of acceptance at the beginning, and then you sort of get to that place of acceptance. And I mean, do you get to a place of forgiveness as well and realize? Yeah, do you know what? It's, it's helped me understand. Oh, it's, it's helped me be more empathetic to his situation. And um, I mean, I still have days where I'm angry at what happened, or days where I'm just sort of sad or, or wish that I could have done something different or, or helped in some sort of a way um, and, and also feel quite cheated out of aspects of my own childhood and mm. you know I've got I've got uh, I've got two kids now I've just I had a had another one about five weeks ago congrats um, thanks very much and uh, it's it's odd you know you, you think oh it's they're never going to meet my dad and that there's a sort of, sort of sadness to that but also you find yourself doing things that my dad did that were great. And you're like, well, I'm nicking that because that was a brilliant bit yeah. of parenting. Mm. And I think um, it's, it's, it, it can be quite a stain on the rest of a person's life totally. when it ends in that way, you know, in such a painful way. Mm. And uh, as I said, you know, he and I had quite a difficult relationship anyway. And so it, it's, 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 I find it hard to pluck out the sort of little, the good bits sometimes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly a lot more at peace with it than I than I was. And I suppose then when you have your own family, you realize the importance of family. Like it took me a long time to realize how important family was because mm. I was doing my own thing and doing TV shows and stuff like this. And then ah and I don't care. My mum's upset about this, so it doesn't matter. You know, she'll get over it. And then, you know, you you definitely get to a place where family's everything. Mm. Mm. And yeah, it, it, it's odd. I I um you know, like people say, like when you have a kid, like your whole world changes. Like I was living my life for me, and then the next day, I, suddenly it was there was someone else. I didn't have that. <laughs> I didn't have that feeling. <laughs> I was like, I still feel like exactly the same person, but I now just have this other person in my life that I'm hanging out with a lot and looking after. <laughs> but I never felt like this grand change. And I thought, God, am I broken? Is something wrong with me? Everyone's like, it's so profound becoming a dad. <laughs> It's changed me forever. And I was just like, I feel exactly the same. Like, literally no change. I just have this other person that's here all the time. I like hanging out Do you with. find it stressful or no? Uh, not really. No. That is amazing. Which, which is interesting for someone that worries yeah. a lot. Mm. I, yeah, I know very... you're going to worry about that. No, because all my anxiety is sort of tied up in me, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you actually in... care about your children? <laughs> yeah, exactly, like, yeah. no, How are you doing, buddy? So Good true. to hang out with you again. It's, it's yeah. all tied up in you, so you don't have time to worry about yeah. other things. Well, it's just like, I, I have no concern. Like, there's no, there's only so anxious you can get with a, with a child. It's like, you know, as long as they're sort of like alive and th happy, everything's fine. They're parenting one. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it hasn't, it hasn't had, it didn't, it hasn't had that. I, I was really worried that a lot of people were like, oh my God, you just changed forever. It hasn't had that same, that same level, a le level of impact. It just feels like a very natural thing that's happened. And I'm very delighted that it has happened, but it hasn't like, uh, hasn't fundamentally changed my perspective <laughs> on life. It's also, we haven't even mentioned that you're hosting Beauty and the Geek. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it came as a bit, as a, a bit of a surprise. It's insane. Honest, really. that's, that's, I love that show. I watched that show on E4 before I <laughs> yes. hosted e on oh, T4, before I hosted T4 back in the day. Like, as a kid, <laughs> I watched it. God. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, really excited to do it. I mean, Mol and I have been looking for like the right thing for us to do for a while. And um, you know what it's like. That some some things come along, you're like, well, it's a job, but is it the right is one? Is it the right one? Yeah. Mm. And this, we were like, it's so, I mean, it's so perfect. I'm be beautiful. She's a bit of a geek. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I, it's a really, it's, it's a really great match. Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're super excited about it. And, um, and yeah, it's a, it feels like a, um, it feels, it feels like the sort of the right next step for us. I mean, I, if, if I could, I would only ever 
just do stuff with Marl forever now. Really? Yeah. Are you that much of a team now, you guys? It's, it's crazy how, I don't know if you've experienced this, but like, you know, you, you have your friends at school and I'm still so tight with all my mates that I went to school with. In fact, I said my mate Reese and I are making this show together. He doesn't even work in telly. He was just like, I got an idea for a show and now he's an exec producer on a show. <laughs> out, no, it's like his first job in TV. <laughs> Hi guys. I never worked in this industry before, but here I am. Exec producer. It's like your brother in the board game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like he's never worked in the board Actually, game. Can we hang like, out? Right? It's like anyone that comes near you ends up quite successful. Just yeah. through sheer convenience. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, yeah, I know you already. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm really tight with my mates. And then, you know, you make friends sort of in your 20s and stuff when you're kind of like it's starting jobs. Mm. But when you're, when you're past 30, and certainly after having a kid, I was like, I may never make another friend again. And I'm actually quite content with that because I've got my 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 tiny group of people. And then Mole came and did just as like a guest host on the radio. She wasn't, she was meant to be there for a month. And then we were meant to have other people. And I'd met her before and in I'd interviewed her in the band and I'd thought, ah, she's a nice person, but nothing, you know, nothing, not, not, not going to have no significant impact on my life. And then she came in and we did this. They said, oh, just record a thing. We need something to like trail the shows coming. Just record a chat. And we recorded it. And I came out of it thinking, oh my God, I've never met a person I've instantly had that rapport with. And I know what she's thinking. And there's something going on where there's, there's a telepathy going on. I couldn't, it's hard to describe. Wow, like electricity. Yeah. And I came out of it and I was like, she should be here all the time. Like literally off, off doing one chat, like mm, she should really? be here forever. And then she did the show and we got to the end of it. And I was like, oh my God, this show is better with you here. We should, I, what, how do I get you to come and be here all the time? And so, and she got offered another job from another radio station at that time. And half after hearing on the show, and I said, please don't take it. I'm going to, we're going to figure this out. And uh, thankfully, our bosses had had the same thought of like, this show's sounding amazing. And I went to them and said, look, please, can she come back? And they were like, we've been having the same thought. And then eventually they said, yeah, she's, she's going to come back. And it's, you know, the universe wow. gifted me a, be a best friend at a time where I thought I already had made all my best friends. That it's, is the sweetest thing. Why the frick do you say that about me, Alex? It's not true. I don't, I don't like to lie. But that is the loveliest thing you can say about an individual. I think. Yeah, it's great. We, it's and and she, she's like, um, it's it's the most like sibling like relationship apart from my sister that I've ever had. It's wow. it's so like you know when you feel like you can share everything yeah. and we're we're like each other's mates, therapists. Everything, yeah. In between, you the just songs. got your buddy there, yeah. Like yeah. we, like the, no stones left unturned with either of us, and it's um, it's yeah, it's it's an amazing thing to have experienced that as uh, uh, sort of a later a later mm. point in your life. I said later point in your life, like I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, so, so how old are you? Now? I'm thirty six. <laughs> yeah. 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 so young. It doesn't matter. Matt, listen, um, we've taken up so much of your time. I I want to you throughout my entire career. You know, even when I first met you back and then, you probably don't remember, you have always been so generous with your time to me, especially when I was just some reality star that, you know, whatever. And you've always been so kind. Oh. Uh, you really have. Well, I think, I think that's, that's an important thing as a human being, whether or not, whatever, whatever <laughs> yeah. industry you're yeah, in. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you, 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 you did that when it probably wasn't needed and you've just always been very generous and kind. And um, the reason why you are so successful is because the, the, the kindness that you sort of absorb from yourself and more people should really take a leaf out of your book. Oh, well, that's very kind of you to say. Oh God, we're just lots yeah. of kind people now. <laughs> it's, it's true. Um, no, that's very, very nice of you to say. Yeah, I, um, I, I remember starting out in, uh, in telly and I had an experience, I'm not going to name the person, but I had an experience where I was co-presenting with someone and uh, they, I think they saw me as either a threat or um, they didn't like that someone new was there or whatever and they made it their mission to undermine what I was doing and made their mission to try and, um, to try and, uh, any, any success I could have, it was like, no, I'm going to throw obstacles in your direction. And I remember thinking, I'm never going to make anyone feel like this ever. I'm going to do the opposite of this, which is if anyone ever asks me for advice or, um, is starting out or is, you know, they're maybe scared or they don't have an experience, whatever it might be, I'm never going to be that person that mm. makes them feel like they can't do what they shouldn't do. I'm never going to throw an obstacle in their way. I'm going to try and show them the route to the yeah. thing. Because 
it, it had such a, I, I remember it so vividly just in that moment thinking I'm never going to I'm never going to do this to someone that is so yeah think, and, you, and so you, you never forget that I think there's this weird way of thinking that you know if someone else succeeds you can't mm. but actually in doing that I think often people then don't succeed because yeah. you end up getting so caught up in their success almost. yeah yeah, and, and there's enough space for everyone to do do whatever not, they're not doing. in board games though not in the board <laughs> yeah, games yeah, yeah. stay yeah, the fuck yeah. away <laughs> Alex if you, suddenly, <laughs> yeah. no, if you have a good idea please bring it to me first <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt listen thank you so much where can we listen to your podcast uh, well, I don't know wherever you get podcasts <laughs> wherever yeah and the board games on your website which is well do you know what I don't know if they are on our website we haven't got a website we're so new <laughs> but um, uh, if you find me on Instagram there's a link to yeah. them there but uh, yeah they, they are fab honestly go <laughs> presents Christmas presents anniversaries yeah uh, anything wakes wakes bring Nog into a wake it's going to really liven it up <laughs> <laughs> it is they are so great and they're so imagined they're so wonderful um, uh, thank you so much thanks guys for coming on the podcast what we like to do at the end is leave our listeners with something inspirational okay Oh, all right. I've got something for you to inspire you. Um, uh, it's can I give a parenting a piece of parenting yes. advice? So um, I, I so I feel like this is the greatest parenting hack that's ever been discovered, which is um, if your kid doesn't like doing something, and then you get them to do it, uh, film their reaction of them talking to themselves for when they then refuse to do it in the future. So broccoli is a good example. Uh, so I got my daughter, she doesn't want to eat broccoli. She eats broccoli. And then I go, I interview her on camera. What are you eating? Broccoli. How is it? It's good. Do you like it? Yeah. How many thumbs up would you give? I'll give it two thumbs up. Say to yourself in the future, sell broccoli to yourself. And she'll say, I like broccoli. It's really good. And I go, great. And I save it in my notes under the word broccoli. And I put the video there. And then the next time she goes mad about broccoli, I go, I I've got someone to talk to you about that. And it's her. And she watches herself and she goes, well, I believe me. So she ate the broccoli. They've got a point. <laughs> it's yeah. the greatest. It saved so much time in my life. You can basically convince. You, you get them to do it once, and then you get them to be the salesperson back to themselves. That's great. That is that useful. Matt, thank you so much. Everybody, we'll see you next week. Bye bye.